Terry Champney for establishing the Leonard Irving Gilman Endowment for lectures and engagement in Jewish culture in honor of her late husband. Um, Leonard Irving Gilman had a passion for exploring Jewish culture. His parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe and he was interested both in the Jewish cultures of Eastern Europe as well as in American Jewish culture, American Jewish history, and Judaism. We're honored to have uh, Terry Chapney and Leonard's son Aaron Gilman live streaming with us today. Thank you so much uh, for making this possible. Uh, before we get started this evening, I wanted to just quickly thank our co-sponsors and let you know of some upcoming events that we're having this month. So I'd like to thank the co-sponsorship of the College of Arts and Letters, James Madison College, the College of Social Science, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the Asian Pacific American Studies Program, the Asian Studies Center, um, and the Office of Intercultural um, Inclusion, <laughs> uh, Diversity and Inclusion. So we wanted to thank all. We have broad support across the university, which we're really thankful for. Um, our next event next week is going to be on April 12th at 6 o'clock in Cups Club Spartan in Case Hall, where we're going to be offering a workshop on recognizing and combating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So we welcome um, everyone who would like to, to come attend that. Then um, on April 18th at 7 p.m., right here in the Kellogg Auditorium, we'll have Professor Michael Berkowitz deliver our annual Rabin Brill Lecture. Uh, he will be lecturing on lesser known perspectives on the Holocaust and photography, the significance of Jewish expertise in film. And then the very next night on April 19th at 6.30 at the Hillel at 360 Charles Street, uh, we'll have our annual uh, forum on anti-Semitism where students at MSU are invited to come share any experiences they've had with anti-Semitism with our, some of our Sterling Institute faculty and Hillel staff. Um, and then uh, lastly, on April 29th from 8.30 to 4.30 in Wells Hall A323, we're having our annual Sterling Institute Undergraduate Research Conference. We have really exciting presentations uh, from our students. Our faculty come and comment on them. Um, family and friends are invited and we're having a complimentary outdoor lunch as well. So you're invited to attend that. Uh, so my colleague and friend, Kirsten Vermeglish, Professor of History and Jewish Studies and core faculty of the Sterling Institute, who's written award-winning books, um, will introduce uh, Professor Helen Kim and then we're, we're really interested and excited about uh, what you have to offer us this evening uh, about the diversity of the Jewish experience. And we welcome, after the lecture, um, people to come to the, to the microphone down here and, and ask their questions. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Kirsten. Yeah, you definitely don't need to applaud for me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing the important stuff here. Um, so I'm so happy to be here. Thank you everyone for coming, especially on this beautiful day. It's really exciting to see people in the audience and thank you to people who are live streaming. Um, and thank you most of all to Helen Kim for coming um, uh, for a, 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 an, a, our first, back to, not our first, but one of our first back in person events. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, my colleague Laura Yaris and I had been talking um, last year about who we wanted to come this year um, uh, for some talks on American Jewish uh, history and life, um, and you were top choice. So we're so we're so glad you could be here. Um, Helen K. Kim is professor of sociology and associate dean for faculty development at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. She received her PhD in social work and sociology from the University of Michigan. So we welcome you back. We're thrilled to have you back. Um, her book, Jew Asian, Race, Religion, and Identity for America's Newest Jews, um, was co-authored with Noah Levitt um, and was published in 2016 with the University of Nebraska Press. Um, and uh, she's spoken about it, or have read part of it, and I'm so excited to hear more. Um, she has also published her research in the journals Contemporary Jewry and the Journal of Jewish Identities. Her scholarship has been profiled everywhere, um, including the New York Times, NPR, the Huffington Post. You might have actually seen it in various places. Um, so we're just so excited to have you here um, and to hear what you have to tell us. The title of her talk um, is awesome. Funny you don't look Jewish. Um, and so let's give her a warm welcome, and we're so happy to have you here. Hello, good evening. I am psyched to be here. Thank you so much. Um, this is my first in-person um, gig in a university setting since COVID. Um, so this is really, really, really special to me. So I 
Um, I, I just want to say thank you to, to all of you for making this happen, and particularly to the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel and to the Gilman family. I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so um, I have a couple of sort of serious, non-serious things that I want to lead with. Um, as Kirsten was saying, I'm a professor of sociology at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, and Walla Walla is in the southeastern corner of Washington State. It's about a five-hour drive from Seattle and about a three-hour drive from Spokane and two hours from Pullman. Um, and the rivalries in Walla Walla, typically um, when you think about the public institutions are really the University of Washington, Washington State, maybe Eastern, um, maybe Gonzaga and Whitworth here and there. Um, so the reason that I'm talking about this is um, I have a, a 10 year old and a 13 year old. My 13 year old is in middle school um, and he's very active in um, band. He's a drummer, he's a jazz drummer, he plays in the band. Um, and lo and behold, I would have never expected for probably the most intense rivalry I've ever seen to be in the middle school band room where the director of music studies and the band and jazz band leader who was based at Garrison Middle School is from the University of Michigan. So there's a huge flag in the band room with an M. Um, and the choral directa, director and the orchestral director who also works at Garrison has a big, you know, um, MSU flag right next to it. Um, so I don't know which one to, to support, um, and I'm just saying that that's sort of a, a slice of my daily life in terms of living in Walla Walla. Um, hi, Mr. Condi and Mr. Garcia, if you're out there. Um, and the second thing that's sort of serious but not serious and sort of speaks to the fact that my life is governed by my stomach, um, I visited the dairy store once and when I was invited to come out to give this talk, I said, I am coming because I want to go back to the dairy store <laughs> where I had toasted coconut almond for the first time. And I think it sort of reoriented my um, taste buds to coconut. And I was sad to hear that it's only open actually Wednesday through Sunday. So actually maybe for lunch tomorrow, that's where we could go. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So shout out to the dairy store, um, and it's great to be here. Um, so I'm a sociologist. I'm a sociologist and a social worker by training. Um, and I'm a sociologist that's really interested in stories, um, in stories, taught, um, stories that we um, can craft through words, through words and conversations with people. Um, so I'd like to spend some time tonight um, talking to you about the story and stories um, in this book, Jew Asian, that I wrote with my um, co-author and colleague and life partner, Noah Levitt. Um, and it's really a story that I think is one of many stories that um, we are unearthing about contemporary Jewish life um, and the diversity of the Jewish people. Um, and I hope it's a story that um, inspires other stories to be told um, because the complexity and the diversity of the Jewish people is so vast. Um, and we're really just sort of starting to unearth the complexity and the diversity of the Jewish people, um, especially when we think about racial difference um, in some interesting ways. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time um, sort of digging into the story that, that Noah and I told in this book. Um, and I'd like to do it by um, talking to you about why Noah and I wrote the book. So fleshing out a little bit of um, the historical context and the moment that Noah and I were in when we decided to write the book. Um, this is a story about talking with other people. So I'd like to talk to you about who we talked to, um, namely, uh, couples who were intermarried across religious, racial, and ethnic um, uh, sort of variations and slices, and I'll get more into that in a little bit, as well as children, um, adult children of intermarried couples. 
Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we found sort of in broad brush strokes when we talked to these couples and these um, adult children. Um, and this book was written in 2016. So um, I have some um, reflections that I'd like to share with you um, as I think about the, you know, why did I write this book and what is really the significance as I think back on it seven years later. Um, and I'd like to also give you a sense of some really new and exciting research that is being done um, specifically on Jews of color. Um, there's a lot of really cool, innovative um, work that is being done both in academic and non-academic settings. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of that wonderful work. Okay, so um, why did I write this book with Noah? Um, there, there are three points that you see on this slide. Two of them are dates and one of them is um, this phrase numbers and words. Um, so I'd like to get into a little bit um, of the why by honing in on a couple of specific dates. The first is 1997. Um, and 1997 is important in my life because that is where, uh, that, that is February of 1997, so about 25 years ago. Um, I met a nice Jewish boy from Ithaca, New York. Um, I'm a second generation kind of kid of immigrants from um, surfer country in Northern California. Um, the two of us meet in the middle at the University of Chicago um, where we're both gradu graduate students. And um, our connection was really, it had nothing to do with our respective cultural or ethnic or religious backgrounds. We really came together and bonded um, over a shared tragedy and that was that of our um, fathers dying at relatively young ages when we were really young. So we bonded um, for that reason and as we sort of grew our love and our relationship, um, the fact that Noah was a nice Jewish boy from Ithaca, New York, and I was a second generation Korean American kid from California, sort of um, kind of entered our lives in terms of recognizing that there were differences on paper for the two of us namely differences in cultural upbringing, differences in ethnic background, racial differences, religious differences. And we really started to sort of ask ourselves, you know, is this a relationship that we could see working over the long term? Um, given that we had this strong bond as individuals, but we were on paper very, very different. Um, so we met in 1997. 1997 is also a really significant year because it is 30 years past 1967. And 1967 is really important because Loving v. Virginia, which is the Supreme Court case that basically abolished um, the illegalization of interracial marriage, that happened in 1967. So 1997 is one generation past 1967, such that in the demographic landscape, we're starting to see kids born of couples who are interracial. Um, so 1997 is a really sort of seminal date uh, in terms of the why in the larger context that I think undergirds um, a lot of what drew Noah and I to this, to this project. Um, the other date, 2000, so just three years after 1997, 2000 was really, really important for us for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is on a, on a large demographic scale, 2000 was the first time that the US Census um, allowed individuals to check more than one race when they identified racially on the census. Um, so it was really the first time that individuals were able to identify themselves as more than one race, biracial, multiracial, et cetera. Um, so that was a really important um, kind of moment in history in terms of thinking about what the racial um, landscape of, this, of the United States was looking like and would continue to look like post-2000. The other thing that was happening in 2000 and 
as Noah and I were kind of going through our um, relationship, um, a little bit of background. I, am, I had no training whatsoever in Jewish sociology and Jewish demography. Um, when I was a grad, grad student in 2000, and when I got my degree at the University of Michigan, my focus was really on looking at um, Korean American women and their beauty practices. Um, so I had sort of a, a, a major shift in the mid-2000s um, that's, that I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but just for context, my training was not in Jewish sociology, Jewish demography, um, Jewish anything for that matter. Um, but in 2000, in addition to the U.S. Census allowing for more than one racial category um, to be a choice for people, um, in the Jewish communal world, um, and I would also say in the Jewish academic world, 2000 was a really important year because the National Jewish Population Survey came out. Um, and the National Jewish Population Survey said X, there are X number of Jews in the United States. Um, and there are X percentage of Jews who are intermarried. Um, and the way that that data was spun was you often heard responses to the NJPS along the lines of the NJPS finds this many number of Jews and this, this many number of intermarried Jews. This is going to the lead to the, the demise of the Jewish people from this data. So in our personal world, while we were not Jewish academics at the time, um, we were constantly hearing in various circles sort of the, the NJPS is spelling the death knell of the Jewish people. Um, and as Noah and I were thinking about, you know, um, evolving our relationship, committing to each other for a lifetime, and eventually having a family, the question in my mind was, is that really the case? You know, is there an alternative story that the numbers, um, and numbers are a snapshot in time, that the NJPS isn't showing us? Um, is there something more than just the numbers? Also, in addition to the numbers just being a snapshot in time, Noah and I were very curious about, okay, well, if we, if we take the numbers and maybe we, we think about them and we um, give them some credence, where are the words? Where are the stories? Where's the meaning? Um, how are these people that are part of the NJPS creating meaning out of their lives in a lot of different and complex ways? Um, so I just want to give you sort of 1997 and 2000 as sort of touchstone dates and um, sort of things that were happening data that was being released and interpreted during those um, time frames to give you a sense of the context that Noah and I were in as we were thinking about launching this study. Um, one date that I don't have down here is 2005 and 2008. 2005 is when I started at Whitman College. I had no idea what I was gonna <laughs> do as a young academic. I was trying to sort of figure stuff out. Um, 2008 is when I was pregnant with our first child, Ari. Um, and it was really around that time when um, I was trying to figure out with Noah what it would mean to bring this child into this world and how we would want to have a family and raise children. Um, where could we go? Where could we go to understand what that might look like? Um, so one of the things that we are really interested in on a larger scale is what kind of data existed, if at all, that looked at intermarried couples where racial variation was considered. So the NJPS largely considered um, couples where one partner was Jewish and another couple was non-Jewish, often of a Christian background. Um, and I think the explicit assumption that was made was that these were largely two individuals who were white, who were racially white. So Noah and I did a little bit of digging to ask 
places like um, the Cohen Center at Brandeis, University of Connecticut, um, Miami University. Um, these are big repositories of sort of Jewish demographic data. Do you keep data that looks at racial variation um, amongst intermarried couples? And our response was always no. We don't keep that data, we don't keep that data, we don't keep that data. Noah and I actually, even in 2008, went to the Union of Reform Judaism headquarters in New York and like went and met with the senior leadership team specifically to ask them this question, do you keep data on race? You know, you, you have the opportunity to collect so much interesting demographic, oh, thank you, thank you. Demographic, my, my throat's cracking a little bit, thank you very much. Demographic data, the ORJ's gotta keep some data, right? On, on, on race, sorry. Um, and we had a meeting with a, a member of the senior leadership team behind closed doors and we asked him this question point blank, like do you keep data on race Con at the level of congregations? Um, and I'll never forget this, he was very, um, he got very quiet and very serious, he, you know, he had, he was speaking in very animated tones and when we point blank asked him the question, he got very quiet and he got very serious and he said, no, we don't keep data on race. And he sort of paused and he thought about it and he says, and I wonder if the reason that we don't keep data on race is because if we did, we would have to acknowledge that racism exists in our midst. So that was a really powerful statement from this person who held a senior leadership position at the URJ. Um, so sort of the bottom line is we had these conversations um, and Brandeis, University of Connecticut, Miami, everybody was saying, okay, we don't keep this data on race, we don't keep this data on race, but you gotta go talk to Gary Tobin. Um, Gary Tobin um, used to head the Cohen Center at Brandeis he left academia to start his own think tank out in San Francisco. Um, and he created an arm of this community uh, sort of research organization called the Coalition. Um, he uh, married a second time later in life to a woman by the name of Diane Kaufman. Um, they were in their 50s and Diane said, I will marry you, but I wanna raise a child with you and they had their own adult children from their respective marriages already. Um, so Diane and Gary, um, who racially present as white, um, adopted a black boy, Jonah, um, and raised him. And they set up a holishon because they never wanted Jonah to have to choose between his race and his religion. Um, so Bechol Lashon, the reason I'm talking about Gary and Diane is because they were so instrumental in sort of supporting um, the research project that evolved into the book. Um, and we really worked with Bechol Lashon to sort of um, utilize their very broad network to get in touch with um, couples as well as adult children. And, and I'll flesh out some more specifics about um, who those individuals are. Okay, um, so between 2008 and 2011, um, we talked to approximately 34 couples in the San Francisco, uh, Oakland Bay Area, Los Angeles, Orange County, Philadelphia, and New York um, area um, with the help of Bacol Lachon in terms of recruiting. Um, we had about 250 respondents um, who answered a survey and we got in touch with 34 of these individuals and I would say um, we try to um, have a sample of 34 couples that ranged across social identities like age, um, ethnicity, religious practice, cultural practice, um, as well as geographical area. Um, these couples were couples where one partner identified as Jewish, however you want to d define that, whether it's religiously, culturally, or ethnically, of any racial or ethnic background, as well as one member who was racially Asian, 
who identified of any religious or ethnic background. So we wound up talking to 34 couples that varied um, um, in age, in terms of ethnic representation, specifically for the Asian partner. Um, there were heterosexual couples, there were gay and lesbian couples, there were couples with kids, couples with no kids. Um, and there were couples that varied in terms of their affiliation, their formal affiliation with a particular Jewish movement um, from reform on through modern orthodox as well as unaffiliated. So we talked to these couples and in addition, we talked to uh, between 2014 and 15, we talked to 39 adult children born to marriages like those of the couples that we interviewed. So I just wanna be clear when I, when I um, flesh out a little bit more what we found with the children, we did not talk to children of the couples we interviewed. We talked to children born to marriages like those of the couples that we interviewed. So rather than um, you know, focus specifically on snapshots and times through numbers, again, you know, we were really interested in sort of digging deeper um, into meaning and meaning making um, for couples and for kids. And I mean, sort of the bottom line questions that we were really interested in asking um, were how couples were thinking about and negotiating their religious, ethnic, and racial identities in the context of a marriage um, or a life partnership, as well as in the context of what it means to build a home and a family life. Um, so we really wanted to talk to couples to sort of understand how they were or were not bringing sort of all of the aspects of who they were including their religious, their cultural, their ethnic, and their racial backgrounds into uh, a relationship as well as into a home. Um, so I wanna focus on a couple of findings, um, sort of broad brushstroke findings in terms of the couples. Um, um, the 34 couples that we interviewed um, were disparate on paper, and they really thought of their connection to one another as rooted in a sense of shared values. And they often talked about those shared values in terms of a set of Jewish values, as well as a set of particular Asian ethnic values. So um, Jewish values, let's say, alongside Korean values or Chinese values. Um, and the values that they really hit on were ones that emphasized hard work, ones that emphasized um, high educational attainment, and close-knit families. Right? That, that was sort of the, the foundation that couples really talked about as seminal to making things work. Um, so I just want to read a quote um, from the book that sort of profiles one individual who we talked to in terms of how this person thought about values. So this is a, um, a Chinese American man married to a, a white Jewish American woman. Um, and he said this about sort of similarities. Um, he said, that's where a lot of the similarities between the cultures that I feel, the Jewish culture and the Chinese culture, are very family oriented. You know, it has a lot to do with family. I feel that both of them are very similar to that. When I came into my wife's family, it was kind of, I want to say comforting. It seemed very similar in that respect. So he goes on to talk about other kinds of values, including, um, you know, emphasis on education, emphasis on hard work as sort of being the the thread and the binding that ties him to his wife, such that the similarities um, similarly expressed by other individuals that we talked to in these couples really served and seemed to offset potential obstacles 
whether or not perceived or real. So the values really undergirded, um, undergirded them in terms of commonalities as well as offsetting potential obstacles. The other thing that we um, really talked to couples or couples shared with us, um, and we were a bit surprised by this in terms of how they bring their various pieces of who they are into the context of a relationship in a home, is um, these were families that were really doing Jewish in a lot of rich and fruitful and very religiously grounded ways. There was a lot of emphasis on um, religious practice, um, connection to communal organizations, um, a lot of home-based as well as com communally facing ways that families were instilling a sense of Judaism and Jewish identity into their homes, and especially for their kids. And Noah and I were a little surprised at the strength and I think the, the force with which these couples and families were actively engaging in Jewish practice both within the home as well as outside of the home. And part of why we were so surprised is because everything that we had read up to that point seemed to indicate that this, this shouldn't happen, right? This shouldn't happen because the NJPS is telling us that we have this number of Jews and this number of intermarried couples, and so we're not going to see what we saw. Um, but you know, everything from um, a regular table ritual to uh, regular attendance at um, synagogue, not just for holidays, but consistent, you know, either weekly or monthly attendance, um, going through a bar bat mitzvah, um, having a ritual circumcision, celebration of holidays both within the home and outside the home. These were really aspects um, of uh, what we saw as sort of a rich engagement with Jewish practice, Jewish ritual that was taking place within the context of, of the home. Um, and I'm just going to bend down again. So these couples were really creating Jewish homes for their kids. Um, so um, we kind of wrote up our, our work on couples, and then we had a little bit of a break. And then you know what we were getting is, OK, well, you did all this stuff on couples. Well, what about the kids? Right? Because it's really what about the kids? And sometimes the question is, well, what about the grandkids? Um, so we decided to interview, uh, again, adult kids who were born to marriages like those of the couples that um, we talked to um, to see, you know, what are the lessons that we're learning in terms of the couples? Are they actually carrying on to a completely separate cohort of adult intermarried uh, kids from intermarriages like those of the couples that we talked to? And I'd like to um, just kind of hit on a few um, key findings. Thank you for the water. That's really helpful. OK. Um, so first and foremost, in terms of the kids. So these are millennials. Um, I'd say first and foremost, uh, a main kind of crux of who they are is that these are individuals who very clearly identified themselves as multiracial. So not to be surprised, I think especially with the 2000 um, options in the census and beyond. These were individuals who really saw themselves not just as one race or another race, but really multiracial, biracial, um, Asian and white, um, Jewish was often used as a code for white Ashkenazi Jewish and Chinese. Um, they're really, being multiracial is at the core of who it is that they are. Um, we also asked these adult kids about their sense of Jewish identity as well as Asian identity. Um, so Jew-Asian identity, I would say, broadly speaking. 
like what we heard from the couples, these were kids who really also grew up with a very strong sense of Jewish identity as a result of being in homes and being parts of communities where um, it was cool to be Jewish. Doing Jewish was really um, significant and meaningful. Um, I have strong connections with people in my synagogue. Um, lots of similar ways of engagement that we found that the couples were telling us were being mirrored in terms of the separate group of adult uh, kids from intermarriage. Um, so really, really strong sense of Jewish identity, um, for sure. We also asked these adult kids about their sense of Asian identity. And I would say if we think about um, sort of a, a, a teeter-totter or a scale, the Jewish identity was very strong. And I would say that the Asian identity was strong, but maybe a little less strong. Um, so these were individuals who did not um, shy away from strongly identifying as Asian. But the kinds of expressions of identities um, were more along the lines of what uh, sociologist Herbert Gans calls symbolic ethnicity. Um, so symbolic ethnicity is um, sort of the more infrequent celebration of holidays, um, thinking about, you know, I'm Chinese because I really love Chinese food, um, the sort of symbolic measures of ethnic identity that were not seen as the same as how it is they thought about the sort of foundations of their Jewish identity. So, um, I mean, just to sum it up, Jewish, Jewish identity was really, really strong. Asian identity was strong, but maybe a little bit less so. Um, these adult kids definitely saw themselves as having grown up in households where there was a similarity in terms of value systems. Um, similarity in terms of, quote, Jewish values alongside Asian or Asian ethnic kinds of values with the same emphases on hard work, educational attainment, um, as well as family connection. So, so, so that was mirrored in our um, adult kids as well. Um, this last point on the slide, belonging or not. Um, so while there was great strength, while there was pride, while there was sort of a fierceness in terms of wanting to own and display um, being multiracial, being Jewish, being Asian, it did not come without some pain points. Um, so these were individuals who um, talked about really feeling a sense of belonging in places like their synagogue, um, their larger Jewish community, at the same time that they also really talked about some very significant points of pain um, that largely revolved around, hey, funny, you don't look Jewish. Individuals who do not racially present as white or maybe racially do not present as what we might think somebody of Ashkenazi descent might look like um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a popular, maybe stereotypical conception. Um, comments like, funny you don't look Jewish. How is it that you can possibly be Jewish? That's interesting, you must be half Jewish. These were commonplace microaggressions that the adult kids that we talked to talked about over and over and over and over again. And what's interesting in terms of what they then did with that was they didn't reject anything. They didn't reject any part of who it is that they were. And whenever, whenever I think about this, I'm always reminded of um, Rabbi Angela Buckdahl Warnick. Those of you who do not know who Rabbi Angela Buckdahl Warnick is, she is arguably um, the most, perhaps the most powerful rabbi in the reform movement today. 
She is the head rabbi at Central Synagogue in Manhattan. Um, she is the first Asian American rabbi cantor ever. Um, her face looks more like mine than it does Brad's. Sorry, Brad, I'm putting you on the, on the spot here. Um, Rabbi Angela tells this story of when she went to Israel, somebody who was raised very, very firm in her sense of Jewish identity and her sense of calling to Judaism. And she talks about this point where she goes to Israel, and she has these moments where people are challenging her and saying, it's impossible that you're Jewish. And she calls her mom. She, she, she tells a story of calling her mom on the phone and saying, I'm just tired of this. Like, I can't do it anymore. I can't be Jewish anymore. And her mother on the phone says, is that possible? So she was in this moment, similarly to our adult children who we talked to, where there was a constant challenging. But I would say what's different with the millennial kids that we talked to is rather than say, I can't do this anymore. What we often found was this actually resulted in these individuals wanting to assert their Jewish identity even more so. It's kind of like a, you know, if you're going to challenge me for being Jewish, I'm going to stick it to you with, you know, like some Torah. Um, so that was a really interesting juxtaposition to sort of think of Rabbi Angela, who's the same age as me, 49, um, and her response to being challenged versus the millennial children um, who had similar experiences but whose response to being challenged was very, very different. Um, so I just wanted to highlight um, that aspect. Um, belonging definitely existed alongside feelings of not belonging. Okay, so so what? Um, so this is interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, we wrote our book in 2016. Um, we're now in 22, right, I think. Is that right? The pandemic has made time stand. So we are in 2022. Um, so six years after the publication of our book. Um, when I think about this so what, I think about this story and other stories um, in terms of the visibility that I think that um, Jews of color, if we want to use that umbrella term, um, are, are getting. Um, I think of this story as unearthing a story of maybe um, a segment of the Jewish population that felt like it wasn't being seen. Um, it wasn't visible to a lot of people, but yet at the same time, um, often felt like they were hyper visible in terms of the kinds of experiences that I just relayed to you. So this idea of visibility really um, resonates for me as I think back to the so what. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to tell a story to make visible things that both felt simultaneously invisible and hyper visible. Um, I really think about the meaning making, um, and again, the debates between the, the numbers versus the, the narratives and the storytelling have not gone away. We're, we're still in the midst of that. Um, but I'm heartened to, to, to see and look out, both in academic circles as well as non-academic circles, a real emphasis in wanting to think about meaning. Think about meaning and not just numbers as snapshots in time. But what's the meaning that we are creating and making um, as we think about sort of the contemporary Jewish landscape and the changing demographic landscape for sure. Um, and I also think about belonging. This is ultimately a story to me about um, and, and related stories that are about wanting the Jewish people to do the work of making everybody who, who is part of the Jewish people and extended family feel that visceral feeling of feeling like they belong, not just included, but that they belong. Um, so I would say with these three themes, I'd really like to highlight, I'd like to stop talking about me and Noah and talk to you about some really, really cool 
um, both academic and non-academic work that I think is really, really exciting and I think is it's sort of starting to explode um, on the scene. And if you all have caught today's New York Times, actually today's online New York Times, but tomorrow's, I think, print edition, um, all of these themes are resonating with a story in the food section that features Michael Twitty um, uh, in terms of thinking about the place of blacks and African Americans with regards to culture and cuisine um, in Passover, in Pesach. So I, I, I'm not gonna spoil that story, but um, it's out there today. Um, so what's next? Um, the Jews of Color Initiative, um, this is an organization that is devoted to um, funding and telling stories um, and research that is done by Jews of color for Jews of color and the larger Jewish community um, with regards to things that are missing, things that are not being told. And one of the, um, the new reports that has come out uh, very recently, last year, is called Beyond the Count. Um, and Beyond the Count um, was a study that both looked at survey data as well as um, interview data um, with a sample of, I believe it was approximately 1,200 Jews of color across the country. So it's the largest study that you know, literally counts and then tells stories from the perspective of Jews of color. So, um, there's a ton of really rich data um, and also some really amazing sort of let's continue the work, what are the next steps um, implications beyond uh, academia in terms of uh, communal organizations and community engagement. So I'd highly recommend that you check out um, the Jews of Color Initiative and the Beyond the Count report generally. Okay. Um, I would love to talk to you about a dear colleague and friend of mine, um, Dr. Samira Mehta at the University of Colorado, Boulder, Colorado at Boulder. She is in both the Jewish Studies as well as the Women and Gender Studies program. She just received a $250,000 grant from the Luce Foundation, um, so she's a humanities person. Um, she is going to, she's spearheading a project called Jews of Color, Histories and Futures that's going to be looking at oral histories, activism, art, um, artistic expression, to sort of, again, tell the story, flesh out the richness of the story and the stories of Jews of color in the United States. Um, so I wanted to profile her. Um, and then finally, um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, a really cool project out of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College that is being headed by um, Rabbi Mira Wasserman. She's with the Center of Jewish Center for Jewish Eth Ethics at the RRC. Um, Rabbi Mira received two hundred thousand dollars from the NEH, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities, to do a one-year project that is a combination of research projects that specifically address race and racism um, within American Judaism. And this aligns with the RRC's commitment to sort of center the voices and experiences of, of BIPOC Jews in order to combat racism. So I just wanna give you some examples of some of the really cool projects that are, uh, <coughs> that are currently being funded under this project. Um, Dr. Buffy Longmire Avital, who is a professor of psychology at Elon University, is conducting research on how Jewish parents are socializing their children to identify and root out racism when it occurs within the context of Jewish spaces. Dr. Mark Goldberg, who is a um, associate professor of history at the University of Houston, is looking at how white supremacy has shaped immigrant experiences for Cuban Jews in, in greater Miami during the mid 20th century. Um, and finally, as another example, Dr. Michal Vitan is a sociologist of American Sephardic Jews and she is looking at how a group of Syrian Sephardic Jews negotiates their Jewishness vis-a-vis -vis American liberalism. This is, these are three of a dozen really, really cool projects that really look at race and racism. Um, from a research perspective, 
But then the next step that, that all of these projects need to do is they develop curriculum as well as an online course that is publicly available. So it's really publicly facing humanities and humanistic social sciences. Um, so I just wanted to um, highlight, highlight those really cool projects um, that I think are really adding to, to the stories that we are able to tell. Um, so I guess um, I'll end by saying, um, before we get to Q&A, um, I'm in a place where I'm feeling really grateful and really um, cautiously optimistic. Um, I think a lot of great work has been done and is continuing to be done, um, both in the academic space as well as in the communal space. Um, and my hope is that we're able to just continue to build off of this really exciting work, um, including all of the projects that I just talked about as well as many, many, many more. Um, and ultimately, I hope that we are able to ask and answer questions um, that speak to all of the complexities of who we are as a people versus who we are not. So I'll end with that and say thank you. Let's talk. I'm happy to, I'm happy to, I'm gonna come over the mic. So thank you for a wonderful talk. I really thank enjoyed you. hearing about the project and your work. Uh, two questions. Yes. One was it sounded like the couples and the children that you looked at for the study. It sounded like a very urban sample. Yes. So I was wondering about that. Maybe you'd say a word about that. Sure. The other was the comment that you received from the person you spoke with who said, maybe we don't keep track of race because it would reveal the racism in the Jewish community. I wonder if you'd, I don't know if you can elaborate more on that. I could imagine a situation where including that data might help show how multicultural the community is, and yet this person felt it would do the opposite. So I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, so the urban, the urban, the urban. Um, so San Francisco, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, New York, um, high proportions of, of Jews, high proportions of Asian Americans, high proportion of intermarriage along racial lines. Um, so that was the predominant rationale for why we focused on those areas. Um, in terms of sampling, those are very convenient locations to draw from. Um, and we were actually getting from our initial survey response responses, um, we were getting a number of responses from those areas, which I think probably speak to the demographic landscape that I just talked about in terms of high concentrations of both of those populations, as well as high concentrations of intermarriage. Um, to the, the comment by the rabbi. So not knowing what sort of headspace this person was in. Um, yes, I think the data, I mean, one of the, one of the very strong points that the authors of the Beyond the Count studies say is that we have to collect the data. Um, and I think there's a recognition that we've maybe tried to collect the data or we haven't collected the data or we've collected the data but we haven't collected it correctly. Um, but their recommendation is we still have to, we, we've got to collect it. Um, and I think, I think the rabbi was really in the headspace of not recognizing that yes, we could sort of say we are a multicultural people. Um, I think he was really in the headspace of, of seeing, yes, we could see that we are a multicultural people. Um, and as this kind of data is important to see where we might not be doing what we should be doing. Um, so I think it was probably both. And the comment that came out of his mouth sort of leaned towards the latter, which I thought was very illustrative and um, 
was the first time that I had heard anybody of that significant of a position sort of say that point blank. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Very fascinating. Um, I have a question that may not be well articulated because it's been going around my head the whole time that you were talking, so awesome. I will try to make it clear. Um, and it's I'm about great with verbal vomit, too. <laughs> okay, good. It's something about the relationship between um, race, ethnicity, and religion. Um, because it seems clear from what you talked about, the couples that you spoke with, that the Jewish person was white and the Asian person was w did not grow up in a Jewish background. Um, and so I, one of the questions is about intermarriage, or, or, or I mean about, um, what do you call it? <laughs> um, um, conversion, yeah. right? And what the place of that was in the couples that you talked about, but also, um, you know, if they came with another religion, not just another yes. ethnicity or racial identity, and then how that was negotiated yep. within the couple. Yep. Great question, and thanks for the opportunity to sort of drill down on the sample statistics or the sample characteristics a little bit more. Um, so on our initial recruitment survey, the, 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 the thing that you had to be was you had to be um, you know, part of a partnership where you were either Jewish of any um, religious, religious, ethnic, or racial background, and racially Asian of any religious or ethnic background. Um, for the individuals who were Jewish, it actually was not all white. There were, um, I believe it was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go dig into the book. Um, I believe it was six out of 34 who were not white um, and who were either Asian um, or were mixed. I'm gonna say, um, I'm pausing because I wanna think a little bit about how it is that they would probably describe themselves back then. Um, they would probably say that they're mixed, Asian, white. Um, so we did not have all white respondents on the Jewish end. Um, we definitely had all racially Asian respondents on the racially Asian end. Um, if, if I could just say a little bit more, yes, so conversion. There were individuals who um, were Jewish and Asian who had converted, but there were also individuals who were Jewish and Asian who had not converted. So that's, um, that's an aspect of our sample that I didn't specify in the beginning. If I could just anticipate maybe a follow-up question and maybe just sort of an opportunity to drill down on some of the sample characteristics. One of the other questions that we often get is, you know, the gender, the gender breakdown. Um, so the common maybe stereotype or, or image in, in one's mind is it's the white Jewish guy and the Asian female. Um, was it only that, that, sli that slice in terms of heterosexual couples? Actually, to our surprise, in terms of our initial recruitment um, survey of the 250 respondents, the gender breakdown was literally right down the middle. So we had um, heterosexual couples where the male was white and the female was Asian, but we also had the reverse. So that quote that I read for, from you, it was a Chinese American man who did not identify as Jewish married to a white Jewish woman. Half of our um, initial survey respondents as well as roughly half were of those two mixes. So it wasn't just all white Jewish guys married to Asian women. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the, the religious part, because I'm wondering yeah. also about if there were other, you know, if the person who was not Jewish brought yes. in another religion yes. and how that factored yes. in thank as well. thank you, thank you. So the partner who was not Jewish who, um, the partner who was not Jewish, there were a variety of religious affiliations. 
um, from no religious affiliation to um, Christian, to Buddhist, to Hindu. Um, so I won't reveal the, the, I won't bore you with the numbers. There was a variety of different uh, religious backgrounds sort of brought into the context of the relationship. Having said that, um, the strength of an attachment to you know, my upbringing as a Catholic was not so strong as to cause long-standing tension um, in terms of obstacles to being on the same page with regards to having a Jewish home and raising a Jewish family. Um, so yes, there were individuals who did identify as Christian, who were the non-Jewish partners, but they were able to do that alongside supporting a Jewish house, um, in part because the strength of their attachment to their religion of origin was not so strong that they felt that it was going to interfere, um, interfere with having a Jewish home. So yeah, a huge reason for, I think, the success of that. Yes, yes. Thank you for a really interesting and important talk. So uh, I, it seemed like, in a way, surprising, given the diversity of people that you're talking to, in a way that you had, you emphasized the commonality in terms of how both the couples and the adult children identified and felt, you know, that they had these common um, experiences and perceptions of their identities and, and values and so forth. And this kind of follows up a little bit on Amy's question too. I want you to speak if there was anything surprising in terms of the diversity still that you found in terms of those identifications and experiences and what you know the people, either the couples or adults attributed those or what influenced those uh, to speak to the diversity of it. And then I was also a little bit interested, and it was, of course, um, um, really tragic to hear of the painful experiences that people had uh, being kind of fully embraced in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of belonging in the Jewish community. And I'm wondering, if, I don't know if part of the questions were also asked in terms of their acceptance within Asian communities and whether they face sometimes you know, um, questions that were also microaggressions and other such mm -hmm. things that they experienced. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Thank sure, you. before you sit down, Yael, can I just ask you, in yeah. terms of reflecting on the diversity, um, is there, I just wanna make sure that I understand the question correctly, is there a particular um, uh, type of diversity that you're I thinking mean, about? Is not there? necessarily one, I mean, but in terms of your main findings that, um, the adult children all had a strong identification with Judaism and a strong with Asian, but you know, was it all kind of the same story for everyone or oh, there was some reverberation or in terms of what the most common values were that they found, um, was it the same kind of variation? And then I guess part of that would be following up on Amy's question whether, um, in t where they were all um, 34 adult children or couples kind of bringing up people religiously and just completely um, Jewish households, which you you know you, you you seem to point to uniformity in all these respects mm -hmm. in terms yep. of that, and so I wanted to you know uh, you could choose one or a couple in terms of whether there was some kind of diverse findings and what your explanations sure. or it, what it. you may have been surprised yep. by in yep. that. Thank yep. you. Sure. Um, so let me maybe speak to the microaggressions piece um, in terms of the attachment to the Asian community. Um, the microaggressions were ones that were talked about predominantly within, the, within a Jewish context. Um, not, not so much in the sense of, um, you know, if and when there was an attachment or a footing in an Asian ethnic community. Um, and part of what they talked about, um, and I think one of the reasons that they really clung to this idea of being multiracial at the time that they did was, they definitely emphasized, I think, um, feeling special, feeling special and unique. And I think that the way that it played out in terms of their acceptance in 
the Asian ethnic community was because one parent was white, I would say that there was a specialness to that that we could perhaps link to colorism um, or where whiteness might sit on sort of a racial spectrum as it gets played out um, when we think about offspring. Um, so there weren't the same kinds of um, challenges or questionings. It was more like, um, you know, you're really special, you're, you're, really, um, you're really beautiful. You know, I, I would say a lot of the comments were about feeling accepted along the lines of physical appearance. Um, and I think that spoke to sort of a preference for, for whiteness. Not the same, and it, and it was not at the expense of then being seen as not legitimate or authentic enough to be Chinese. Um, so it, it did not have the same kind of flavor as I would say the kinds of microaggressions where they were really challenging um, belonging and authenticity um, as being Jewish in Jewish spaces. Um, and these were microaggressions, I'm sorry, both in Jewish spaces as well as outside of Jewish spaces. They were the most painfully felt in Jewish spaces. Um, I'd say in terms of the diversity, um, so for the kids, uh, in terms of their Jewish affiliation, they were largely reform. Um, they, they came from largely reform backgrounds. Um, but there were also individuals who also came from conservative as well as orthodox backgrounds. Um, and I would say that the way that they talked about the fluidity of identity, so all of the different aspects of who it is that they are, um, was quite diverse. Um, so there was diversity in the fluidity with which they saw all of their different kinds of identities. So there wasn't one sort of you know, blanket response where fluidity looked a particular way. Um, and I think that's consistent with how millennials generally, um, what we know about the millennial generation in terms of how it sees itself as very, very fluid. So, you know, um, as an example, uh, one respondent talked about how um, they felt that they could be sort of simultaneously secular one day, feel secular one day, but then really um, feel pulled by their orthodox roots and, you know, that sort of fluidity and going back and forth alongside being multiracial. Um, I, I would say the, the diversity that I think about when I think about um, the adult children was the diversity of responses were very much around thinking about identities as fluid. Um, so they were able to kind of be who they wanted to be in a variety of ways at any moment in time. All the while, I think, also keeping, you know, um, and holding strong to their identity, however they wanted to define it, as, you know, Jewish as well as Asian and as multiracial. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was just as great as I had hoped. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so I'll kind of like Amy, I have yeah. some follow-up questions and also I have things kind of swirling. So I yeah. apologize if they don't, they don't come out exactly right. So one question that I have is, so all these um, uh, couples, it sounds like we're very committed to doing Jewish. And I'm curious if they were also committed to doing Asian or w whatever was the particular yeah. sort of community that yeah. they were in. Um, and then I guess I wonder if that, you might see some kind of correlation to sort of a less strong, yeah. you know, the way that you define kind of a less strong Asian identity in the children. And then also I wonder if that might be connected to like the ways that race and religion and ethnicity, sort of in the ways that Amy was talking about, yeah. that religion could be seen as something you would do, um, mm -hmm. you know, that it's a practice, you know, um, but I don't know. So yeah, I guess that's great question. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to um, kind of flesh out some, some other findings. Um, 
So doing Jewish um, in all the ways that couples talked about doing Jewish, both within the home context as well as within um, the communal context. Um, so if we think about synagogue attendance, um, you know, schlepping for uh, Sunday school, to go to Hebrew lessons, you know, B'nai mitzvah preparation, um, doing home-based practice on a consistent basis. Um, I have a former student who's, who's Jewish who says, it takes a lot of time and money to be Jewish. Um, and the reason that I'm saying that is not to joke about that, but to say, I think that's actually part of what we saw. So within the context of thinking about a family and resources, and often limited resources, as well as what were often um, couples who were living in places where there was a synagogue down the street, or there was a JCC down the street, whereas the Chinese Cultural Center was way across town. Um, it often tended to be that the preference would be to allocate the time and the resources towards doing Jewish versus schlepping all the way across town to do Chinese language school. Um, so it was a sort of what's within our immediate sphere of availability um, as well as what's the time and money going to look like? So I would say that was a significant um, maybe structural or economic factor that played into what these homes and families looked like in terms of, yes, doing Jewish, but also as well as doing Asian ethnic uh, identity, practice, cultural, ritual, et cetera. Um, I'd say there was a strong connection to families of origin. So the attachment of kids, um, you know, to say the Korean grandparents. Um, so some transmission, not just in terms of the food and the, and the, um, uh, the cultural celebrations, but language and attachment to, to family members, I think, um, was definitely present. Um, but at the level of then engaging with resources outside of the family that were communally based, the preference definitely was for doing Jewish, for sure. Um, one thing that I'm compelled to say, I haven't really talked about gender, um, but I'm gonna verbal vomit back to you, um, is to say um, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, well, let's talk about in the heterosexual couples the role of women. Um, so I think there was a historian by the name of Bill Sin Karen Bilson, who said, women are the keepers of the culture. Um, women were the keepers of the culture. No matter if you were the Jewish woman, you know, doing the Jewish and the Asian ethnic stuff, or if you were a woman who was not Jewish, the women did all of the schlepping, they did all the transportation, they did all the scheduling, all the, all the aspects of women being the keepers of the culture for both the Jewish as well as the Asian um, ethnic culture. Um, so I just wanna sort of emphasize that um, the division of labor was very clearly split along gender lines in terms of, the, in, in terms of what it meant to do the work of um, instilling identity and practice in the home. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe connect yeah. to talk about the adult children and how they sort of. Like oh, in terms of how they then experience it? Yeah, so I would say um, it maybe is not surprising then to think about you know, a sample of couples who were, um, who were making choices around resources, um, around options, around opportunities, to then I think see the strength of the identity maybe playing out in the adult children in different ways, um, similar kinds of experiences. So a lot of time spent at synagogue uh, in Jewish communal spaces, much more so than in Asian ethnic spaces and communal, Asian ethnic communal spaces. So yeah, there was consistency, I would say, from the couples to the, to the experiences of the adult kids. Thank you.
thank you again for such a, a wonderful talk and, and presentation. Um, I was really intrigued uh, by your stories about different couples, um, including uh, Theo and Noah, really kind of bonding over similarities between your two cultures. And it struck me that one of the similarities um, that is often talked about as a sort of classic stereotype or archetype of both Jewish and Asian families are certain stereotypes around mothers um, and mm -hmm. uh, to <laughs> uh, and ways in which they are overbearing and have opinions about mm -hmm. their children and the kinds of things that their children should be doing, including who their children should be marrying. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, you, you tracked two generations, um, parents and children. I'm wondering how the, the grandparent generation, right, uh, the, the parents of the couples, the grandparents of the adult children, um, whether the ways in which they uh, responded to, embraced, played a role in their children and, and grandchildren's lives, how that, um, if that's something that you analyzed, um, affected um, affiliations, feelings, uh, affect, um, towards both the, the Jewish and the Asian side of the, yeah. uh, the children and then the grandchildren. Yeah. Um, I'm channeling my mother and my mother-in-law right now, um, who both of whom I'm, I adore and I feel very close to. Um, so I'll, I'll thank you for the question and I'll, I'll answer it um, in, in the following ways. Um, we did ask the couples, um, so like, you know, was there pressure from your parents, you know, both sets of parents to um, marry endogamously, so within your own group versus exogamously, um, to use um, academies terms. Um, by and large, there were very few instances in which people said like, oh yeah, my overbearing mother is pressuring me to you know, marry a Korean um, or a, 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 a Jewish person. Very few instances of that. Having said that, um, it wasn't necessarily all rosy in terms of the relationships between uh, the two members of the couple and then their extended um, family members, particularly the parents. And really what it boiled down to was differences in communication style. Not really like, I don't, I, you know, I don't think you should be with this person because they're of a different racial or ethnic or religious background than me. It's like, you know, maybe I don't like this person because I just don't get them. Um, so, that really boiled down to communication styles. Um, so, um, having said that, in the instances where we heard about those issues, it, it seemed as though the couples were sharing with us, like, but we're, we've actually, we're working on it. Like, so there, um, there was a sort of active work being done internal to the family to communicate, to basically communicate, to sort of bridge um, and keep communication lines open. Um, so I'll say that. It wasn't about like, you know, you, you, you need to marry a nice Jewish girl um, or you need to marry a nice Chinese boy. It, there, it wasn't like that. It was, it was um, I just don't, I just, I'm having trouble understanding this person. Um, but folks were working through it. Um, and I'm totally sorry, Laura, I'm blanking on the second component of the question, which is, Oh, right, so were grandparents involved? Um, we asked how, we asked like, what's, you know, what's your relationship like with your parents in terms of the couples? We asked like, so how involved, if, if there are kids, are you with the, are your parents with the kids? Um, a lot of involvement, and actually, um, I think to Kirsten's question, in terms of transmission of some aspect of ethnic identity for the Asian parents, there was definitely, we definitely heard 
many examples of grandparents sort of um, having an active part in terms of instilling some sense of Jewish identity in their grandkids. So I would say, by and large, active grandparents when grandparents were physically around. Um, so yes, I would say grandparents were a key, um, key people in these, family li these families' lives, and we didn't talk to the grandparents. Um, that would be the follow-up you know, sort of longitudinal study. Yeah, thank you. I know there's some great work being done on grandparents too, so thank you for that question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so my question is, in sort of bringing your research back to our campus, what can we do to allow diverse voices to, sp to fill Jewish spaces on campus? And what sort of work have you seen in student-led settings to allow these diverse voices to be heard? Hmm. In student-led settings. That's a great question. Um, one, I think representation matters. So representation matters at all levels. Um, so part of the, uh, as I reflect on the visibility um, question or reflection for me is, um, what's the visibility like you know, as, as step one? Um, and that is not just in student settings, but um, what sort of visibility is there? I'm gonna look to the faculty, you know, in terms of faculty as well, uh, in terms of um, just visibility writ large. Um, I would say there is um, a fine line between feeling like you are including particular perspectives and voices, but where you might be doing the work of inclusion that doesn't necessarily mean that belonging is taking place. So again, that aspect of like that, that, that psychological sense that like, I don't have to be anybody else, I can just be me. Um, yes, I was asked to come here, but maybe actually I don't really feel like I belong here. Um, so not knowing kind of what's on tap for you all, um, you know, wondering to what extent the choices that you are making or investigating are ones where you're just trying to, like, are you bringing people to the table? Are you, um, there's a famous like, diversity educator training who has this line that says, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Um, so then there have been some follow-ups to that, like, well, what if you don't wanna dance? You know, like, who controls the playlist? You know, what, what if you can't, what if you don't have a ride to the dance? So I guess maybe using that framework to think about, you know, the who and the what and the, what are you feeling in here um, as you're thinking about the spaces that you're talking about and maybe the, it sounds like the programming you're developing. You know, what is it, is it diverse, equitable, inclusive, and does it foster a sense of belonging? Um, I, would, I would spend some time really thinking about that first versus rushing to, you know, put somebody on a, on a program. You know, what, what do we, how can we think about these kinds of spaces as spaces that really are DEI B and possibly A, um, the A being anti-racist spaces? What, what sort of work do we need to do in order to be able to say that we're sort of on a, a, a playing field before we build something? Um, that really is looking at things through a DEIB or a DEIAB lens. Um, 
So I think that's a long-winded answer to say, um, I, think it, I think it depends on the framework that you're, you're looking at these things first and foremost versus you know, rushing to um, enact something. And we can talk about that more later too. I have, I'd, I'd love to have some back and forth with you about that. Thank you for that question. You okay? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello, thank you for the excellent talk. Thank you for um, coming. Uh, I have a question about, <coughs> sorry, I'm blanking a bit right now. That's okay. Uh, it seems that uh, within these Jewish-Asian relationships, there's a lot of commonality between the two cultures that help with uh, forming that relationship. And especially with regards to, um, um, to the relationships with uh, children involved, there's a lot of investment in, cr in uh, allowing the children to have um, Jewish identities um, with, with allocation of resources. I'm just curious um, if you see like a trend in how that affects with regards to the Asian spouse their connections and feelings of belonging within Jewish communities and Jewish spaces, or how they feel, how they see themselves culturally. Is it some sort of, is it adoptive, or is there like still a distinctly Asian identity uh, within those spouses? Okay, so I just wanna be sure I, I'm completely understanding your question. So um, in terms of thinking about cup couples? Yes. Um, the Asian spouse, do they, I'm sorry, do they feel like they're sort of losing part of who it is that they are or giving up something? Oh no, I was just wondering, I was just wondering there's like some sort of trend with how they felt a connection with um, Jewish communities. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah, I would say um, in general, the Asian spouse felt welcome in Jewish spaces. Um, so included, you know, asked to participate, felt welcome. Um, and again, I think this actually speaks to this idea of belonging. Um, I don't know that they would say that they fully felt like they belonged. So that sort of, again, that emotional sort of connection to say like, here are my people and I don't, I don't have to change who it is that I am to feel like I truly, truly belong. Um, and while I didn't talk about this specifically with the couples and I focused on the kids, um, there were instances in which the Asian spouse who was not Jewish um, and sometimes the Asian spouse who was Jewish would talk about similar kinds of instances of being challenged um, in a Jewish space because they didn't racially present as the image, the stereotypical image that we might have of what a Jew in this country looks like. So there were instances of um, not feeling like they belonged um, and being questioned. Um, because of what they looked like racially. Having said that, those experiences were not strong enough to want them to give up participating and for them to continue to say that they did feel included. And actually this is one of the things that the Beyond the Count um, study highlights is that there's both. So Jews of color who have felt in white white Jewish spaces, like they, they were included and they belonged, at the same time that they talk about mac microaggressions as well as macroaggressions in Jewish spaces. So um, that study in particular with more people really highlighted that Jews of color have experienced both. You know, both feeling like they belong in white Jewish spaces and included, but also feeling like they don't. Um, so I would say that that was somewhat um, reflected in in the spouses, um, the Asian spouses of the couples who we interviewed. Thank you. 
Thank you. Oh, can I just ask one quick question? So did, I am curious to know if folks have a favorite flavor from the dairy. <laughs> and if they would be, if they want to shout it out. Any favorite flavors? Oh, the mac and cheese? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I heard about the tr the cherry, the black cherry. Okay, okay. Oh, okay, lunch tomorrow. Okay, thank you, everybody.